Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I would also like to thank the organizers for the possibility to come here and present, present some of our findings that we have been doing together with David. I just counted the number of publications, and we have more than 120,000 publications together with David. And I think it's sure that I have learned a lot during that journey. So what I will tell you today is a little bit about the Helsinki Bird Cohort study, something old, something new, something borrowed, not sure about the blue thing, but anyway, I would like to start with the birth of the Helsinki Bird Cohort study. Um, we go back in time more than 20 years for sure, and like many others now in the field, wanted to prove that David was wrong. And it could have been due to socioeconomic factors, like somebody suggested, or something else. So we had, in fact, started to collect a small bird cohort study of 1,000 women. But fortunately, David and myself ended up at the EU meeting, where the host never came. It was a complete catastrophe, except for the fact that the study really started there. David came to Helsinki, beautiful summer day, in 1994, we were sitting at the terrace. You could do something else than write a BHF grant application. But that's what we did. And this is the reason why I am here. David was very successful with this application. And the first 10 years of Helsinki Bird Cohort Study was to a large part funded by BHF, which is, of course, greatly acknowledged. The reason why we were successful with this grant application was probably due to the fact that there were many cohorts around the world that had data on prenatal growth, uh, birth weights, uh, growth during infancy. But what was different in Helsinki birth cohort study was really that we did have information on growth during childhood. So we could try to see, we could try to study how these childhood growth factors modified these early risks. And this is one way to try to il illustrate this. What you see on this slide is the hazard ratio for coronary heart disease in Finnish men in relation to early growth. Right here, you have the ponderal index at birth. So the worst place to be is in the back row. Then you are born thin and small. But by far, the worst place is here. You start out with a low ponderal index, but you end up in the highest BMI group at age 11. So I heard David showing this slide. And David used to say that it's the journey that you take from birth until age 11 that's really determining whether you will develop the disease or not. This has later been called, I think, very appropriately, a mismatch. So there's a mismatch between your body size at birth and your size attained later in childhood or later in life. There's one other point with this slide that I think would be worth mentioning. And that's the fact that if you only look at body mass index at age 11, and you can look at this highest BMI group with the BMI above 18, they have no increased risk for coronary heart disease, probably because of the fact that there's no mismatch between prenatal growth and growth later in childhood. So we have, like you heard during Clive's presentation, been spending more than one year together in various locations in the UK, in France, in Finland, in Lapland, and so on, and writing various kind of papers. And we were always aiming high. We were always writing the paper for the New England. But the editors didn't always understand the <laughs> papers for some reasons. This time they did it. So this is um, another of the findings from the Helsinki birth cohort study, where you could see the trajectories of growth among children who later developed coronary heart disease. Uh, the growth for the whole cohort follows the zero line, and those who later developed CHD, they uh, had a lower weight, they were shorter, and had a lower BMI from birth throughout infancy. And later in childhood, <laughs> there was an increase in BMI and weight, lesser one in height. We were also living in the times of a large breakthrough in genes. 
And I guess most of us know what David thought about the importance of genes, and uh, certainly millions and billions of pounds went to genetic research, and very little has come out of it so far. One of our first uh, genes that we were focusing on was the PPR gamma 2 gene. The PPR gamma 2 gene is a gene that's closely involved in glucose and insulin metabolism, uh, body composition, and so on. And we know that those people who are carriers of the so-called ALA allele, they are protected uh, against diabetes. So it's in a way a protective diabetes gene. Here you can see fasting insulin concentration. Those people who are born small with a low birth weight, they are supposed to be more insulin resistant, and they certainly are. They have the highest insulin concentration, but if they happen to carry the ALA allele, this allele seems to protect them against the negative influence of a small body size at birth. We have later been taking this a little bit further in collaboration with um, Leif Group, and this slide again shows you the prevalence for type 2 diabetes according to birth weight and genetic risk scores. So all high-risk genes for type 2 diabetes were genotyped that were identified in 2009. And once again, being in the back row is the worst place. Then you have the highest genetic risk score. But to our surprise, we could see that having all the risk genes didn't increase your risk for type 2 diabetes if you happen to belong to the highest third of birth weight. If you had the highest genetic risk score, you had a small body size at birth, your risk of getting type 2 diabetes was significantly elevated. And uh, this is once again a really true statement. I remember when David said, I never thought I would write about genes. The first paper came out, it received quite a lot of interest, and after finding these interactions between early life and genes, David became very keen on this subject, and he even started to believe in genes, at least to a certain degree. So if everything is determined early in life, does lifestyle really, really matter? Does it make any difference uh, if we exercise, how we eat, how we drink? This is from our older cohort, from men born 1924 to 34. So when we studied them, they were about 72 years of age. And you can see that those men born with a low birth weight had a really, really high prevalence of diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance, but those who exercised regularly were completely protected against diabetes. Then again, if you look at these other groups, exercise didn't have a similar protective effect. You could see the biggest effect in the low birth weight group. A few words about salt. And um, there's one of these common dogmas in medicine that salt is really increasing your blood pressure. Salt is the reason behind hypertension and so on. And we wanted to look at this taking birth weight into account. And this is a study published a couple of years ago in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that we could clearly see that the association between salt intake and adult systolic blood pressure is largely modified by birth weight. So if you look at those people who have a birth weight below 3 kilograms, a 1 gram higher daily salt intake was associated with 2.5 millimeter mercury, higher systolic blood pressure, until the saturation point of 10 gram. Those who had a birth weight above 3 kilo, we couldn't see any association between salt intake and blood pressure. We have had these various findings where we have been irritating people in the public health field, uh, not on purpose, but we're just believing our, in our data. And based on some of these data. Uh, there have been rather big stories in the daily newspaper, but it's rather frustrating when these papers appear. The following day, the director for the National Public Health Institute is, is writing and telling the big audience that nothing is true what these people say. So 
we have had some opposition. But I fortunately did find this slide recently, and I just came from the uh, European Association for the Study of Diabetes meeting in Vienna, and we are probably next year going to have a debate about the role of salt in blood pressure. It's certainly not as clear as it has been stated. So we are what we eat. We have been looking at how people with a different start in life, if they are born with a low birth weight, grow slowly throughout infancy, if they react to food intake differently. So we challenge them with um, a healthy diet and a Big Mac meal. They were matched in adult life for body mass index, age, sex, and so on. The only difference was really their starting point in life. And uh, there are two points that I would like to make by this picture. If we look at the fasting values, in this case, fasting triglycerides, we don't see anything. Most studies in the medical field are done in the fasting phase. And we don't spend that many hours of our life in the fasting state. So when we start to stress these people with a healthy meal, you can see that those people who, have, uh, who started their life smaller, they had a markedly elevated triglyceride level after a healthy meal and after the Big Mac meal even higher. And if you take your next meal at a starting point of 2.3, this could be one potential explanation why a low birth weight uh, slow growth during infancy is associated with, for example, coronary heart disease. So what about food intake again? Um, David quite often also asked, are there any more diseases left to solve or have we solved them all? Sometimes we got the impression that we have been through colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, hypertension, coronary heart disease, psychiatric disorders, and so on. So we had sometimes problems in finding new diseases. So we were focusing upon food intake. And uh, this slide again shows you that um, the intake of fruit and berries in adult life at the age of 64 seems to be associated with body size at birth. A one kilogram increase in birth weight was associated with a 500 gram higher fruit and berry intake on a weekly level. I don't know the underlying causes. Somebody suggested to me yesterday that it could be POMC or PYY336, but <laughs> we will see. Um, we are all getting older, so is our cohort. <coughs> our cohort is approaching 80 years soon, so Nowadays and in the future, we are going to look at aging from a life course perspective. I'm not going to show you any data on this today. I would like to focus a little more on another aspect. Um, we started to focus primarily on birth weight, childhood growth, but also the importance of maternal characteristics has, had gained a lot of interest. This is from a more recent paper where we're looking at maternal body mass index during pregnancy. In the 1930s, 1940s, we didn't have any obese women in our cohort. So maternal BMI in pregnancy was between 24 and 28. But just what you see here is that one kilogram per square meter increase in maternal BMI was associated with the significantly higher risk for diabetes in women. There were gender differences and higher risk for stroke, while higher maternal BMI was associated with a higher risk for coronary heart disease in men again, even after adjusting for socioeconomic factors. <clears throat> this is a slightly similar approach looking at the importance of maternal adiposity or BMI. So we have been looking at healthy and unhealthy aging. The people who are participating in this part of the Helsinki birth cohort study are frail women who are offspring of lean mothers or obese mothers. So we have two groups, 20 women in one group, 20 in the other group, and uh, the intervention group is doing 
a lot of traditional exercise in a gym. We are studying them very carefully, looking at the heart with uh, echocardiography, MRI, um, looking at the brain, the bones, everything that we can think of. So they are spending two days in a row being carefully examined, both before the intervention and after. And what we see, just to show you one example, is that maternal body mass index during pregnancy some 70 years earlier seems to influence brain atrophy in the offspring. It's rather scary. Um, I would like to end by showing you how I feel that we have also been taking um, the findings in Helsinki birth cohort study a little bit further. And I would like to briefly introduce to you the so-called radial study, which is a lifestyle intervention study. Um, originally, more than 800 women were um, included in the study. Some were randomized already in the pre-pregnancy stage when they were planning pregnancy, and some were um, randomized during the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, what you can see is that those people who were in the intervention group, they showed a slightly lower weight increase. The difference is really, really small, half a kilogram. They had more healthier dietary habits, habits, no massive difference, and they did a little more exercise. So in a way, looking at these factors, we were slightly disappointed, but then when we started to look at the results, we could see that small differences in lifestyle during pregnancy certainly what was associated with lower glucose values in the third trimester in the intervention group compared with the control group. And we could also see a 49% risk reduction in gestational diabetes in the intervention group. And uh, I think this is one of the first lifestyle studies that has fairly convincingly been able to show that you can reduce uh, gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes, at least based on our findings, is a really, really complicated disease. It's extremely heterogeneous. And I will just show you this result in order not to mix up everybody's head. Um, what we are doing now is that we are following up the children and the mothers from this radio study. The children are five to six years old, and we are looking at their dietary intake. We are uh, monitoring sleep. We are monitoring exercise. We are looking at body composition, both in children and mothers. We are looking at um, pulse wave velocity and everything that we have been thinking about, and probably a little bit more also. Also, some psychological outcomes. So in a year or two years' time, we will see whether a lifestyle intervention in these high-risk mothers has positive influence on their children. And uh, the underlying thoughts is, of course, that <clears throat> we believe that pregnancy is an ideal window of opportunity and has a lot of potential to prevent cardiovascular diseases even in two generations at the same time. So we will rather do that kind of reprogramming than this kind of reprogramming. Here are some of the people who have been involved in the Helsinki birth cohort study and some of the foundations that has been supporting our work that's been going on now for more than 20 years. Last but not least, thank you, David. Thank you, Jen. We have all learned a lot. It has been a great time, and we are missing you a lot. Thank you. <laughs>